Mike Walsh, how do you get sales in tough times? How do you persuade people to spend money and spend it with you? Hi, Declan. I, I think I think the key for us is, and, and it's quite a cliche, but it's really been concentrating on what our customers are telling us they want. And fundamentally, in our uh, line of, of products, tyres, uh, price is pretty important. So, you know, first and foremost, we invest in price. And then we we try and look to add value through the through the supply chain. I think the key for for us and and where we've had an advantage and probably prospered more so in the last few years is we've been able to build a business from the bottom up, bottom up, utilizing the best of the web, the best technology, um, and fairly light touch infrastructure. So uh, we we've been able to uh, to really capitalize on the change in market and and really played into the hands of of customers who are looking to spend their pounds more wisely. Mm, so the argument is that no matter how tough the economic times are if your business model is right if your business is sound you'll be successful i think so and i think the best businesses really are ahead of the curve in terms of understanding when custom habits are going to change it's very difficult to judge they're very difficult to call but i would say that certainly in the last 12 months or so and you see some of these big names maybe faltering on the high street you've got to say that some of these guys just frankly haven't moved fast enough mm. and the market's changed and the customers have moved. Uh, Lance Batchelor from Domino's you're nodding fairly vigorously. There. I am nodding vigorously I think there's a core rule here which some people will forget and that is you've got to remember what the heart of your business is all about you've got to concentrate on the core and that matters even more in troubled times than it does when times are good and, you know, if your core is selling tyres online, then you put your heart and soul into getting that right, which is what Mike has done in his business. And then you look at the likes of M&S, which I'm not an expert on, but, you know, they've got a couple of cores there. One is food, which they're very good at. The other is women's clothing of a certain profile and age group and so on. And I just think they've been distracted. Well, there's a big tax change if you run a business and you've got workers. You now have to send information about their pay packet to the taxman every time you pay them at the time that you pay them. It either has to be done automatically using payroll software or online if you're a small business running the payroll yourself. And there's all sorts of stuff that you need to hand over. Some of it's new. Uh, you need information about temporary and casual workers, even workers that you don't pay national insurance for because they earn less than the limit. The Revenue's calling all this real-time information and uh, much more, of course, on the Revenue website, hmrc.gov.uk. Um, Mike Welsh... As an entrepreneur, as someone with uh, workers uh, in your company, this is going to affect you? Yeah, and, and, and I think that, um, I mean, we, we probably see it as a, as, a, as a positive in that we are, you know, we're geared up technologically to EDI link to our suppliers and to, to kind of various parties, stakeholders in our business. So it's not really a huge change for us. But what it does mean is that we've had a few occasions where, frankly, people have been paying the wrong tax code and had a nasty surprise at the end of the tax year. So let's just hope this means that... So people, this might make it less likely. Well, we hope it'll be you a You surprise me, you say. I always expect small businesses to start chuntering on about red tape any time this happens. Ah, look, I mean, we've got to pay tax. At the end of the day, if, if it means we, we pay the right tax first time, it's going to make everybody a wee bit happier. The yep. fact the fact is we've got to pay too much of it, but that's that's life, isn't it? <laughs> Lance, actually, your payroll department would have been struggling with this as well. Well, I, I'd echo Mike's point. Uh, I think it's the right direction. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a payroll department and the systems in place that mean that, uh, not quite at the flick of a switch, but a little bit of work, we can get the right processes in place. I've always been worried about the smaller businesses out there, which perhaps are not as tech-savvy as Mike's business is, uh, and are doing it all on paper. And yeah. I think some of them may struggle with the transition but I believe they're allowed until October to prepare but we're all right on that. Yeah and, and I think there's got to be obviously the HMRC have got to have a little bit of flexibility and, and, and we hope there's going to be support to, to get businesses in, in, in a position and you know, the, a time that suits them at, at very little cost. Do you think small businesses that should know about this Sarah that should know about it are actually aware of it? Um, well, that's a moot point. I have to say, quite a lot of people we've been in touch with over the last few weeks about this um, are kind of suddenly alarmed that it's come over so quickly. Um, I think there's, you know, a slight limit to what HMRC can do other than what they have done to tell people that this is actually happening. It's been quite well broadcast on radio and TV and so forth. 
Um, so I said, I think it's very difficult, though, if you're not quite, you know, you haven't got all the systems online, you haven't got everything all prepared. And even if you have, to be honest, quite a lot of the time, as we all know, especially with big IT projects, they tend to go kind of bung in the first few weeks uh, until they actually get up working properly. So I'm, I'm sure there will be a few teething issues with this one, too. HMRC.gov.uk is the web address for the taxman if you're looking for more information on that website. And Lance Basher, what does the cold weather do to your business? <laughs> Uh, it's not as simple an answer as it might be. The answer is we like cold weather. We love rain. Um, there are many jokes in our business about doing rain dances in the office uh, if the weather's getting too sunny because, of course, people would rather stay home if it's raining and order a pizza. Uh, when it gets too cold and icy and horrible, then it starts to get awkward because our delivery drivers can't make it to the customer's home and we are 75% a delivery business. So we got hit by a three-week spell very early this year where at one point two-thirds of our stores were unable to deliver and that really, of course, hits your numbers. But uh, um, three months of rain. Is there anything anytime. you can do about that? Any contingency well, planning you have in place? There's winter tires through Black Shape. Winter tires <laughs> through Mike. There's one answer for us. I will pick it up after this, Mike. Next time. Um, the answer is we can go so far. Oh, it's quite funny, really. You'll get customers phoning and saying, Look, it's really horrible out there. The roads are not safe, so can you bring me a pizza, please? <laughs> uh, and, uh, it's not safe for me, but it's all right for you. That's yes. right. And at the end of the day, we have to and do look after the welfare of our drivers so we won't send them out on the roads when it gets unsafe who makes that decision is that you in head office or is that the because you're a franchise business so they we pretty are. much run it's the themselves. store managers uh, and in this technological era the store managers will be linked in with their regional managers who can take a look at the weather forecast they very often can even look at a webcam and have a look at what it looks like outside wow. we will not send people out if it's dangerous mm. is it a problem for you that it is a collection of uh, pretty autonomous independent businesses uh, that operate under your name? That's a great question. I mean, most of my career, I have worked for big corporates, um, the likes of Tesco and Vodafone, and I've always been impressed by the level of employee passion that you can get at a, at a well-led company. I have never seen passion and engagement like you get from franchisees. It's uh, something Mike and I were chatting about earlier on because mm -hmm. he's got franchisees as well. Uh, if you lead franchisees in broadly the right direction and they buy into what you're trying to do with them, you can liberate a degree of commitment that I have never come across in my career before because they're building a business for themselves, for their families. They're building a legacy. Every penny they put into the business, they see a return on that investment. And, you know, I sometimes say to my team at the headquarters, when we all go off to our beds at 11, 12 tonight, the franchisees will still be there in the stores working hard and making and selling great pizza. Uh, and so I'm actually hugely impressed by what is possible in a franchise business. Mike, your business is franchise as well. Uh, you went for that because that's a way of growing quickly? or Well, we, we um, I mean, fun, I, I spent time um, at Quick Fit. I sold the business to Quick Fit and I spent a few years there kind of learning the ropes, if you like. And uh, w what I found was that there was a there was a, a, a lot of independent, real first-class independent businesses, second, third-generation family businesses um, in the market who were probably not getting the, the fair enough share of the market and actually it kind of dawned on me that if you could turn these guys into a network and then create a just-in-time supply chain you could probably take a lot of the cost base out and and deliver savings back to customers and as, as Lance says I mean we we really do see it, and I'm kind of not overstating the point here that it's kind of like mobilizing an army with these guys I mean there is an inherent level of customer service that you probably really do struggle to reach with you know with with, a, with so many employees in the field and you probably have to work harder at it so we're really blessed that we've got a, a great team of guys who are, who are delivering for us every day mm. but you are the business your business is in their hands yeah absolutely and we kind of we, we trust that and they trust us there's kind of a mutual thing there so but we have regional trainers and managers who will develop their businesses with them and and for them so um again we kind of set the parameters and, and 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 give them plans and and you know to a certain extent they are taking a modular operation from us because we need to make sure our customers get a consistent service and what we tend to see in Domino's is that the franchisees act as an internal police force. If they see another franchisee letting the side down for any reason, it's their brand and they're passionate about protecting yeah. it. And they will be the first ones to go and nudge their neighbour back into line or Absolutely. have a quiet word with them.
A colossal failure, guilty of toxic misjudgments, self-deluded, incapable of facing realities. MPs, Lords and the Archbishop of Canterbury didn't hold back in their report into the collapse of HBOS and the people they fingered as the guilty men. The bank's former chief executive, Sir James Crosby and Andy Hornby, and its former chairman, Dennis Stevenson, Lord Stevenson. Amazingly, it might seem, two of them work for investment firms and one of them runs a major chain of high street bookies. The report said the regulators should think about banning the three of them from ever working in the financial industry ever again. Today it's emerged the business secretary Vince Cable has asked his officials to find out if formal proceedings can be brought against the three of them to do just that, to ban them from running companies altogether. Simon Walker is Director General of the Institute of Directors. Good evening to you, Simon. Good evening. Should they be banned? I don't know. I mean, there's a formal process that will assess the role that they've had and, and will take a, a proper position on this. But look, no one emerges from this whole affair with glory. Uh, and that includes the politicians. Uh, Vince Cable actually was one of the very few people who said a long time ago that the sort of orgy of lending uh, was excessive and needed to be checked. But most politicians actually didn't, and, 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 and most of the regulators didn't either. And I think we, we, we shouldn't forget that it was the Prime Minister of the day, Gordon Brown, who actually at a cocktail party persuaded Lloyd's, which was a bank that had hitherto been really cautious and sensible, to take over uh, HBOS, which was at that stage uh, completely in a state of devastation, and by doing that wrecked two banks rather than the, the one that had already been wrecked uh, in that era. So, so no one emerges from this um, with credit. And I'm not sure that a kind of ritual bloodletting of, of three individuals will actually serve any particular point. Nice bit of misdirection there, Simon, blaming the politicians. <laughs> well, well, they, they're, um, I, I, it's, it's a politician on this occasion who's kind of saying, let's, uh, let, let's rip into them, let's uh, have done with them. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's to be remembered that when politicians set themselves up as the regulators, as the people who guarantee or the people who, who say things will be all right, um, that they, they, they put themselves in, in this position. When they, in turn, um, end up destroying uh, a bank uh, like Lloyd's um, through, through, through this process, I mean, that's, that's something they deserve to be held to account for. Mm. Let me ask it another way. You're a seasoned hand in the boardroom. If any of those three walked into a boardroom and sat down beside you, would you be comfortable? I think I'd be deeply sceptical, um, and I'd particularly be sceptical about their ability to uh, to look at a high-risk venture with the degree of caution that a board of directors always ought to have. I mean, the point about a board is it's meant to be uh, watching and holding in check the executives of a company, the people who are, who are meant to be running the company on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think one of the things that went wrong with the with the banking sector is too many of the great and the good uh, were put onto boards and actually didn't do anything uh, when they were on them. They thought everything would be fine, uh, Oh, this is a nice honorific for us, uh, we'll be paid, not even a great deal for most of the non-executive directors, um, but we'll have a position of honour. And we won't watch like hawks to make sure that the interests of the ordinary shareholders are being uh, looked after. And that is their job. I mean, it's an incredibly onerous job. It's extremely demanding. And I think people who take it for granted are always going to end up uh, in difficulties. And so they should. I mean, it's, a, it's an honourable and important role, um, but it's also a very demanding one. So you don't think they should be banned, but you don't want them in your boardroom. Thanks very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Simon Walker, thank you very much. He's Director General of the Institute of Directors. Lance Batchelor, you've uh, not terribly long in, in your role. You took over the hot seat when uh, Boxing Day 2011. That's right. right. So yep. just over a year or so ago. How rigorously does a new boss look at what his predecessor did? I think a tip that someone gave me a few years ago was try and get the truth on the table. And you have a unique opportunity when you come in as the CEO of a business for the first time to ask the unaskable questions. And so 
what I personally have done on the three occasions I've taken over a business is to spend the first six to 12 months just going to see everybody I can get to and asking them to tell me it like it really is. And I think if you talk to enough people, you have a chance of triangulating a sense of what the truth really is. And if that truth is unpalatable, then you've got a unique opportunity to change the direction. And, you know, there was nothing uh, on the scale of the financial uh, industry that I've had to cope with in my businesses. But there have always been things that I've wanted to change because I wasn't happy about them. Uh, And you've got to do that in that first year or so, because otherwise you become complicit. You lose the perspective that you had when you first arrived. You get just too close to the trees and uh, you've missed your moment. Mm. Uh, That's changing a few things. It's a different magnitude entirely to completely throw a strategy into reverse. And this is the criticism that was made of Andy Hornby, that he didn't change course when he took over from Sir James Crosby. It is the criticism that's made, and I'm not an expert on the financial industry. Oh, sure, so I'm cautious I'm, I'm, yes, about I'm, commenting. And I'm not asking you to, but the, the yep. idea, just speaking as someone who yeah. is operates at those levels, how easy is it in realistic terms to go into a business and say everything you've been doing up to now, it's wrong? It depends. And in Andy Hornby's case, he inherited a business which was widely recognised or acclaimed as an enormous success story, where the regulators, from what we can gather, appeared to be entirely happy with what was going on, where the board, which was made up of the great and the good, all seemed to be very supportive. Uh, And I remember the newspaper articles um, lauding the state of HBOS and the fact that Andy Hornby was taking over at the time. No one seemed to have any problems. Then the whole world came crashing down and there seems to be a slight degree of ritual decapitation going on. Yeah, yeah, well, that's fair cop. There were financial journalists, so Sarah, I'm not looking at you, but there were financial journalists lining up when Crosby stepped down to say what a visionary the man was, what an inspiration well, he was. Well, yes, and, he was and a I brilliant think banker. when Andy Hornby was brought in, I mean, quite a lot of people did say he's a retailer. Oh, what a clever idea. It's, no, yes. Well, quite a lot of people said he's, his background was in retailing rather than in banking, so it's always seen as a bit of a surprise. Uh, obviously, Crosby, you know, very much brought him in as a protégé, and... Uh, it was a bit of a hospital pass, I suppose, giving him the job. You have to ask, like, you know, why do people get these jobs in the first place? Maybe the people who appointed them uh, should obviously be, um, you know, looked at a bit more. But do you know why he got it? Because at the time, all the rage in banking was that they well, weren't that much different from a supermarket. So well, yes, let's exactly. have this guy and that was a... <laughs> who used to be a big noise in Asda to come in and That was a problem. That was like a, a fundamental super... misunderstanding, wasn't it, of the banking mm. sector? I mean, even Lord Stevenson himself said, well, I didn't really understand what was going on because I was only there part-time. It seemed to be a complete <laughs> dereliction of duty. I mean, you have to look, though, I suppose, at why these three people are being singled out when there's a lot of others, you know, RBS, Bradford Bingley, Northern Rock, who also had to have state aid to be bailed out. Um, and the FSA is only actually ever once, you know, censored one person, uh, H. Boss Peter Cummings, who was fined and disqualified being a director uh, last year. So I'm not quite sure what Vince Cable or someone can actually do to prove that they've been doing any wrongdoing without actually being formally kind of. Uh, punished by the authorities when it comes to disqualifying a director you know you can you can disqualify someone if they've acted fraudulently or failed to keep records and so forth but obviously there is still a duty of care to your creditors and your employees uh, and you have to um, you know if you can prove maybe they've acted unfitly when it comes to their office i think it's a bit of a legal challenge for them to do that though when it's if you're just singling out these one these three people mm. My it, is, isn't the challenge as well though that this is not just a company governance issue it's an industry governance issue so actually that, you know, the people who were brought to task, the people who were meant to be regulating and setting the parameters were not doing their jobs either. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the I guess, a bit of, I would never give sympathy like, to any of these big bankers, but at the same time, Andy Hornby's come into a job. I guess that he's looked at, you know, the surroundings. There's a governance um, set up there with the chairman. He's he's probably looked at it and thought, well, this is this bank's in great shape. I'm here to do a retail piece of work here. I'm but there were warning signs. There were whistleblowers. There was a chap by the name of Paul Moore who was forced out of the business because he uh, was warning uh, too many people about too many things going wrong. How do you have things within a company, within a business, to tell you when something's not going right? F- facts. We, we, I mean, as a business, and we can talk as a smaller business, I guess, we base all, pretty much all our decisions on, on, on data, on facts, and co- whether it be customer feedback, which is, which is brought in as data, whether it be business performance information. And frankly, we do it because we just don't think we've got the 
brains, frankly, or the experience to, 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 to make those decisions without that information. So we've got a business that is you know, is really foundation with, with information and we make the right decisions as a consequence. I guess when you're talking about the issues in, in the financial industry, one of the challenges has been everybody was doing it, weren't they? And nobody was saying stop. So therefore you set a, a train in motion and the difficulty is who's going to put the foot on the brake. Yes, because if you have got those checks and balances within the company themselves... Well, you're looking um, for the adults. You're just going for it. The adults in the room to yes. say, stop playing. <laughs> has any business changed the way it does business as a result of any lessons learned from the banking crisis? I'm not sure you're asking the right man here. <laughs> <laughs> My pizza business hasn't. Yeah, that's <laughs> we're, we're carrying but, on making them rounding and making them hot. The things that Mike was talking about are universal lessons that apply... To all sectors. I think, I mean, just at our level, we have uh, heaved a sigh of relief, if you like, that we ignored the siren calls six, seven, eight years ago to leverage up, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there were people, well-reputed people around us, suggesting that we should borrow a lot of money. Yeah, we, and we had thank the God same. we didn't. Yeah, sorry, Lance. We, we had exactly the same as a growing business. And, you know, our big, uh, the big litmus test was us, for us was, what are we going to do with this money how can it yield a return and is it great value as a as a borrowing for us and strategically and we kind of deemed and we've got a great chairman he kind of helped guide the ship and say well actually even if we had this cash we wouldn't be able to put it to, to great use mm. and there's a lot of a lot of consultants a lot of uh, advisors at the time both um you know in the kind of boom of kind of 2005 2006 but also before the kind of dot com era the turn of the century that people were saying you've got this money or well, you know, spend it or mm. borrow more leverage up and we've got still got pub companies like punch and enterprise who are still catastrophically hit by the amount of debt they took on uh, you've got the dot coms who went bust because they were told to take lots of money or spend the money they had straight away so you do wonder who's advising these people and where are they and i think they're getting off scot free with their hefty pensions mm. Quick thought from you on setting up your business. Very, very precocious tale, this. Uh, but also uh, one of uh, great inspiration to many uh, entrepreneurs. You you start, you start decided to set up the business after you'd been made redundant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and after a prompt from my grandfather that nobody in this family has ever claimed dole and you're not, you're not going to be the first one to either. So I was, I was kind of encouraged to find work. But I was a tyre fitter. I was, as I, as you say, I was made redundant within about 15 months of starting my first job and started selling tyres um, to my pals and then started a little mail order business in Liverpool with the help of the Prince's Trust, built that and it was it was a, a, a mini success and we were all very proud. And then I was invited to come and join um, the big ship that was QuickFit, you know, which, who were the market leaders then and they still are now um, and learned a, a hell of a lot there. Um, they were bought by Ford. I then was spent some time over in Detroit, and this is kind of all in such a small period of time. So one minute I'm under a car in a Nissan dealership in Speak in Liverpool, the next minute I'm sitting in Worldwide, Worldwide Headquarters 2 in Detroit. You know, it was kind of a bit of a whirlwind. Wait, how old were you at that point? Um, well, my, when I started my first No, when you were sitting in the boardroom of Ford in Detroit? To, uh, just turned 20, I think. Did it at any point strike you that, what on earth am I doing here? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I thought, I, I, you know, I used to think... You know, one of these days somebody's going to kind of cotton on to me. You know, I'm kind of, I must be a fraud. But the reality, I guess, that was that I was kind of, I've always have been, and, and back then I was very much a straight talker, and people kind of liked that. So um, it worked for me. But 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 I didn't want to be part of the big business, so I decided to uh, to come back and start again. So I've started Black Circles. 